good morning all doctors welcome to our uh, first uh, part of the symposium on diabetes unfortunately because we have uh, some technical difficulty so we will not be doing any live streaming today but we'll definitely uh, record this session and upload to the youtube uh, the symposium has been arranged in keeping in view how we actually handle our patients in wellness center so it's going to be a very specific information delivered to you how to handle them and how we can improve the uh, diabetes care in the wellness center so <clears throat> uh, we have uh, five speakers today and at the end of the uh, symposium towards the end we are going to run a mcq quiz which uh, will be conducted by dr sen gupta uh scenarios from the wellness centers are uh, included in that mcq quiz and uh, he will give most scientific and evidence based uh, explanation on how to handle a particular case scenario of diabetes so i first welcome uh, the first speaker dr rashmi patwadu she is going to speak on the diagnosis and investigations in diabetes in both old and new patients Yes, ma'am. Good morning to all. Uh, well, I am no authority on diabetes, and I am not an experienced speaker as well. But I am just chipping in for an absent speaker. So if I, um, there are some faulty slides, or there is some fault, please bear with me. Thank you. Uh, we begin our session with uh, investigations and monitoring in diabetes because diabetes and hypertension are essentially silent killers so the patient who comes to the opd does not enter with clinical features of diabetes until complications set in so we have to detect diabetes pick them up by investigating properly So what is the purpose of these investigations? We have to diagnose diabetes and monitor diabetes and investigations are the mainstay in diagnosis and monitoring of diabetes. So when the patients come, who should be screened for diabetes? Any patient above 45 years of age must have his fasting glucose done. Any patient who is below 45 but with a BMI more than 25 and with risk factors like sedentary lifestyle, a family history, a low, HD, uh, low HDL, hypertension, IHD, a history of PCOD, or gestational diabetes, or a baby with a 4 kg weight, any previous impaired glucose tolerance, or any insulin resistance syndromes must be screened for diabetes. We all know this, what are the criteria for diagnosis of diabetes. There are three ways in which we can diagnose diabetes. A fasting glucose of more than 126, more than or equal to 126. A oral glucose tolerance test, 25, 75 gram OGTT, which gives a two hour sugar of more than 200. Or a HbA1c of more than 6.5. HbA1c was not initially uh, approved as a diagnostic criteria. But after standardized assays are available, it has been approved as a diagnostic criteria and the HbA1c of more than 6.5 is diagnostic of diabetes now. Any symptomatic hypoglycemia with a random sugar of more than 200 can also be labeled as diabetes. If all these um, investigations come normal, still we have to repeat them after three years in patients who are eligible for screening. In the absence of unequivocal hypoglycemia, if any of these is positive, then you have to repeat it on a second different day to label the patient as a diabetic. The concept of pre-diabetes. Diabetes is actually an evolving disease. As we can see here, this is the beta cell function which deteriorates over time. Initially, uh, the complications increase, insulin resistance increases. This in the middle, is the impaired glucose tolerance and the impaired fasting glucose patients 
who are prone to developing future diabetes. So impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose are precursors of diabetes. So this is where we should pick the patients up in our OPDs and manage them properly to prevent further complications here. So the concept is that any impaired fasting glucose where the post um, OGTT glucose may, may be normal but the fasting glucose is between 100 and 126 not more than 126 which is the criteria for diagnosing diabetes is a patient with the impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance means that the 2 hour post glucose load is between 140 and 200 because more than 200 is frank diabetes. This is important because these patients are prone to cardiovascular risk. There is a two times increase in cardiovascular risk and a five times increase in future, uh, uh, future uh, diabetes over a period of just five to ten years. So we must pick these patients up and manage them appropriately. Then there is this concept of uh, metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is Metabolic syndrome is basically a cluster of risk factors. You can call it metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome or syndrome X. Uh, all different bodies have agreed upon these five, five criteria. Three out of these, if they are positive, then we can call it as a metabolic syndrome. The criteria here is a waist circumference of uh, more than in Indians. It depends on the population, various populations or world over. But Indians probably a 90 centimeter in male and a 85 centimeter in female. Uh, elevated triglycerides more than 150, a reduced HDL, BP more than 130, 80, and elevated fasting glucose which is more than 100. These are the five criteria. If three of these are positive, then the patient has a metabolic syndrome. These patients have again this cardiovascular and diabetic risk, so they are to be managed appropriately. This we all know, what are the targets uh, in diabetes? We have to manage the patients so that the fasting glucose is between 70 and 130, the PP is less than 180, and the BP is less than 130. Only glucose is not to be uh, targeted in uh, diabetics. The blood pressure, the lipids are also to be managed. The LDL should be less than 100, we know in IHD patients less than 70. The HDL should be more than 40 and the triglyceride should be less than 150. HbA1c. Uh, glycation of proteins uh, is in, in essentially um, glycation of sugar on a protein. Uh, so in N-terminal valine is glycated in uh, hemoglobin and this results in a HbA1c value. The HbA1c value is essential because it remains stable over a period of three months because it is related to the life of RBCs and not to blood sugars which vary on a day-to-day -day basis. Because the life of RBCs is somewhere around 90 to 120, so over a three-month period, the HbA1c essentially remains stable. We have seen that HbA1c more than 6.5 is diabetes. HbA1c between 5.8 and 6.5 is pre-diabetics. HbA1c within 5.5 and 5.4.5 and 5.8 is a normal. And anything below 4.5 is a serious risk of hypoglycemia. In fact, anything below 5, we should consider hypoglycemia and uh, then monitor accordingly. Uh, the, these are the mean uh, sugar values related to various HbA1c values. Essentially, we can say that a value around 6 is somewhere around a mean, mean blood glucose of 125. A value around 9 is somewhere around 200 and a value around 12 is around 300 mean blood glucose. So, HbA1c should be interpreted uh, depending on other confounding factors because there are conditions in which HbA1c can be lower than normal or higher than normal and there is a discrepancy between the fasting sugars and HbA1c. So, HbA1c, the two most important uh, conditions in which HbA1c is normally altered in our OPDs is iron deficiency anemia and uh, kidney disease, CKD. In iron deficiency anemia, there is normally elevated HbA1c levels and in uh, kidney disease, ESRD, they have a lower HbA1c levels. 
So there is a discrepancy between the HB and C. You have to interpret HB and C in that fashion. Other factors which elevate HB and C are a severe hypertriglyceridemia, hyperbilirubinemia, alcohol, salicylates, opiates. Then vitamin C supplements can either lower or elevate the HB and C. Vitamin E supplements generally lowers the HB and C. Ribavirin and interferon alpha also lowers. Pregnancy gives a lower HB and C. In fact, HB and C is not a very good investigation in pregnant patients. Only in the first trimester we can rely a bit on HB and C. Otherwise, in pregnancy, uh, oral GTT is the uh, diagnostic investigation, and we have to monitor blood glucose. In fact, self-monitoring of blood glucose is the mainstay of monitoring in pregnant patients. Then these genetic variants, HBS, HBF, HBC, they variably vary the HB and C. So H, that when the values of HB and C and fasting PP do not tally, then we have to look for these factors which we just talked about, whether these conditions are present in the patient. Follow-up and frequency of testing. Now in our OPDs, this is important because sometimes uh, in the rush of the OPD, we may not know what investigations have been done previously. If they have not been recorded, we don't know. But there is a certain frequency of investigations which we must follow in all diabetics in the OPD on an annual six monthly or three monthly basis. So these, uh, oh, sorry. these are the investigations which have to be monitored. Blood glucose has to be monitored if it is controlled. I think you need to Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. Blood glucose has to be monitored every three months, right? Uh, if it is uncontrolled, then it has to be monitored every 15 days till it gets controlled. HbA1c has to be monitored in a controlled patient at least yearly. Or six monthly is a better, but at least yearly. If it is, is fairly controlled, then you can do it annually also. And an uncontrolled patient has to get his HbA1c done every three months till he gets controlled. Then a patient developing complications, if he has nephropathy, uh, we have to screen if he has nephropathy. So his creatinine, microalbumin, or USCR and 24-hour urinary protein, if the USCR and microalbumin are deranged, has to be done annually in normal, non-complicated patients. In nephropathic patients, we'll further see how they have to be done. Retinopathy patient has to be referred to an ophthalmologist every year annually in controlled patients and in patients without any uh, retinopathies. But in patients with retinopathy, they have to be referred every six months, three months, or as per the ophthalmologist's suggestion. Whenever he is calling, we have to refer the patient to the ophthalmologist. Neuropathy testing has to be done in our OPDs. Unfortunately, we are probably not having enough time to test neuropathies on a regular basis. But patients who have chronic diabetes over a period of 10, 15 years, who have symptoms of, say, small fiber or large fiber neuropathies, uh, must be tested for neuropathy. There are three tests uh, which can be done. Uh, you have to examine the foot every three months. You can do foot examination three monthly. Monofilament testing should be done annually in no, no, normal patients. And uh, biothesiometer we don't have in our OPDs, but biothesiometer is basically a uh, glorified tuning fork. So you can use a 128 hertz tuning fork instead of a biothesiometer to test the vibration sense in the patients. Uh, slide again. Actually, I had a picture of how to test monofilament, but apparently it has not appeared yet. Just show <laughs> uh, monofilament. Yes, I can show the monofilament. This is a monofilament. Actually, I can pass it on. Uh, this, this is a monofilament, which has to be applied perpendicularly like this. There can be two ways in which we can use a monofilament to test neuropathies. There are four sites or ten sites. There are four sites on the foot. Uh, suppose this is a foot. 
then first third and fifth metatarsal head of first third and fifth metatarsal and the uh, plantar side of the toe and the dorsum of the first web these are the four sides if any of these sides the patient cannot feel the filament then we can say that the patient has a, a neuropathy uh -huh. plantar side plantar side first third and fifth metatarsal I cannot show my foot like this. <laughs> I can show it on his foot. Uh, the plantar side of the uh, toe and the first web, torsal side of the first web. So if out of these four sides, any one side, uh, any one side shows that the patient cannot feel, then we can say that the patient has loss of protective sensation, LOPS we call it. And out of 10 sites, if four sites are showing this uh, defect, then we can say that patient has LOPS. Those 10 sites are first, third and fifth metatarsal head, uh, two points in the middle of the dorsum towards lateral, then uh, on the heel, first, third and fifth finger and the dorsum. That Dahamad, if, if out of those 10, four sites the patient does not feel, then we can say the patient has loss of protective sensation. This is something which we can do in the OPD. Biothesiometry, etc., we don't have, so it's. But you can use a tuning fork and apply it on the dorsum of the web, first web, and if the patient does not feel, there is loss of vibration sense. Other investigations is has to, which have to be done yearly are ECG, lipid profile. Treadmill test after five years of onset, and then once every two years, depending on the symptoms and the cardiological profile of the patient. Now, the complications of diabetes. Diabetics have various complications nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy, macrovascular, microvascular complications. So, all of them have to be dealt with. Patients of nephropathy have to be picked up. In the early stages of nephropathy, we know the stages of nephropathy, CKD 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 stages, depending on EGFR. I have not written them down here, but they can be seen in this map. Oh, actually, I am not very conversant with this. So, you can use other points, sir. Green. Next, here, so, uh, so, essentially, what is important in monitoring nephropathy is that whenever we do a serum creatinine, instead of writing the serum creatinine on the notebook, it is essential that we mention the EGFR along with the serum creatinine. Annually, we are doing the serum creatinine for all patients who have not yet developed nephropathy. We write an EGFR, we will come to know that the patient is developing nephropathy, stage 1, stage 2. If we catch them there in stage 1 and stage 2, they can be referred appropriately to the specialist or in 3, 4, 5 to the nephrologist for proper management of the nephropathy. So EGFR, you can all download EGFR applications on your mobile if everybody has. And so EGFR has to be mentioned along with the serum creatinine every time we do. And we should do a serum creatinine every time annually for even for normal patients. Um, the in various stages of nephropathy, the proteinuria gradually increases as we can see and the GFR decreases. Initially in stage 1 the GFR is a little raised but then the GFR decreases from 90 to 60, then 60 to 45, 45 to 30, below 30, and then ESRD is less than 15 EGFR. Uh, the proteinuria increases, a moderate increase is 30 to 300 milligram in 24 hours, or 20 to 200 microgram per minute, which is uh, microalbuminuria. And later, previously we used to, used to say macroalbuminuria when it crosses 300 milligram per 24 hours. So that becomes a severe nephropathy. How do you screen for nephropathy? Uh, these four tests can be used as screening for nephropathy. A simple urine lipstick, you can show albumin, but that is not a very uh, useful uh, criteria. A spot urine microalbumin or a UACR are the two most uh, important for uh, picking nephropathy early. And a 24-hour urinary protein will show the extent of nephropathy. If these are negative, then still you have to repeat it every yearly to monitor diabetes. But if they are positive, then they have to repeat it two more times 
to diagnose a nephropathy before we label on a single uh, reading. So if they are positive, then you have to do it twice again over a period of three months, let us say, to diagnose it, diagnose uh, nephropathy. Uh, why, when should we not send a patient for a USCR or a microalbuminuria? We should not send the patient if the patient has fever, if the patient has UTI, if the patient has uncontrolled hypertension, CCF, or after vigorous exercise. So we should tell the patient if you are going to go to uh, do your microalbumin, don't jog in the morning and then go to the lab and give your urine. Don't do that. So because after exercise, the reading may not be correct. Uh, in CKD stage one, normally the investigations in nephropathy, in the first stages of nephropathy, you can do it annually. In the second stage, you must do it generally all investigations six monthly, except for maybe HB and lipids, which you can do yearly. In CKD 3, most of the investigations should be done three monthly. But when the patient progresses towards CKD 4 and 5, then as per the nephrologist's advice, or at least monthly, all investigations must be repeated. These are the investigations which have to be done in later stages of nephropathies. So we have to do every month in stage 4 and 5 at least hemoglobin, calcium, phosphorus, electrolytes. The PTH can be done 3 monthly in later stages. And uh, PTH can be done 6 monthly in G CKD 3. But all other investigations, hemoglobin, calcium, phosphorus, electrolytes can be done monthly in all these stages in nephropathy. Uh, we must refer to a nephrologist when the creatinine rises say above 1.7 to 2 if the USR is more than USAR is more than 300 if the hypertension is difficult to control if the anemia is severe and intractable if there is hyperkalemia or if you suspect that the nephropathy is because of causes other than diabetes then we must refer to a nephrologist if there is unexplained hematuria, probably the uh, cause of the nephropathy is not diabetes. So suspected non-diabetic nephropathies, if there is a rapid reduction in GFR without a proteinuria or there is no retinopathy but there is nephropathy which is unlikely in diabetes, there are systemic symptoms which is fever or arthralgias or other systemic symptoms, rash, then we have to refer to a nephrologist to see that it is not a non-diabetic nephropathy. Neuropathies. Neuropathy in ah, I have this picture here. Okay. Neuropathies can be diagnosed by, as I said, a monofilament test, a biothesiometer. And then tests like NCV uh, can also be done and other tests to rule out other causes like vitamin B12, folate, protein receptor, heavy metals, lead poisoning, porphyrins, TSA, TNG, etc. can also be done. Immunological testing is for specific patients. So these are the signs, as I said, 1, 2, 3, 4, if this is extra. And this is the, this is the side on the dorsum of the foot. These are the 10 sides, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and on the dorsum of the foot. 4 out of these 10, or any one out of these 4, is good, good enough to diagnose neuropathy. Neuropathy can also be autonomic neuropathy, which is diabetic autonomic neuropathy. We have to consider cardiac neuropathy, GI neuropathy in autonomic neuropathies. It can be cardiac, GI, genitourinary or hypoglycemia. Unawareness is a very important aspect of autonomic neuropathies. Uh, pseudomotor peripheral vascular manifestation, pupillary involvement is part of diabetic autonomic neuropathy. But what we should mostly be bothered about is cardiac autonomic neuropathy which gives rise to partial hypertension. GI symptoms, bloating, genitourinary and uh, hypoglycemia unawareness is very important part of autonomic neuropathy. These are various tests which uh, monitor heart rate response and BP response to uh, Valsalva maneuvers, standing and uh, isometric exercises. These are the criteria but essentially uh, it boils down to the fact that in the OPD probably what we can do is a BP response to standing. We can check the postural hypertension. BP is me measured when the patient is lying down in two minutes after standing. And if there is a fall of 
more than 20 systolic or more than 10 diastolic then we can diagnose a orthostatic hypotension and some autonomic impairment microvascular complications are mainly cardiovascular and cerebrovascular we know uh, the investigations which we can do on an OPD basis regularly essentially is a ECG which has to be done every year a echocardiograph depending on the patient symptoms uh, other tests higher like stress test or cardiac CT MRI and geo we refer to these two <laughs> uh, foot care foot care is a very important part of a diabetic patient in our OPDs primary care so foot care neuropathy neuroarthropathy and peripheral vascular disease these have to be monitored every three months as we say foot examination every three months the patient has also been to, be, to be taught self foot examination in fact there are uh, extendable mirrors which are available for patients to see their own feet uh, we normally don't see patients doing that or we are not advising we are not having enough time but then probably we should do that uh, these are the various foot related problems ABPI ankle breaking pressure index is a good indicator of the arterial uh, blood supply in the feet ABPI less than 0 0.09 is abnormal ABPI of less than 0 0.05 warrants an urgent referral to a vascular surgeon in case of any patient not only a diabetic a vascular ultrasound angiogram can be advised by the vascular surgeon we can do it neuroarthropathy Charcot joints is a problem with the patients who come with foot uh, problems swelling pain instability x-rays can be done bone scan can be advised MRI can be done for those patients uh, therapeutic footwear can be advised for patients with foot problems and therapeutic footwear can be done uh, after doing these basic there is computerized testing for therapeutic footwear as well as a simpler testing is uh, Harismat yeah Harismat I have written yeah Harismat is there intrinsic muscle strength testing is done by keeping a piece of paper between the toe and the second finger of the foot and the patient is asked to catch that while we uh, sort of uh, snatch it away from the patient if the patient is able to hold it patient has sufficient muscular strength if the patient is not able to hold that uh, piece of paper the muscle strength is deficient hypoglycemic emergencies and hypoglycemia I think uh, it is not on OPD basis so we can deal with it later other special situations some investigations in children in elderly and in pregnant diabetics it's, it is a different situation in children uh, ketones to monitor uh, ketonuria and certain uh, genetic testings and autoantibodies can be uh, invest can be asked for serum c-peptide serum insulin x-ray GHG, these are important in children in the elderly the hypoglycemia uh, sorry the glycemic targets can be uh, elevated a bit because in elderly we don't want hypoglycemia preventing hypoglycemia is more important in the elderly rather than preventing complications which are going to be say 10 or 15 years later it depends on the life expectancy and the kind of the patient elderly so in elderly we can keep reasonable goals which is about 7.5 to 8.5 broadly in the 70s you can have a HbA1c goal of 7 in the 80s you can have a HbA1c goal of 8 you need not have a HbA1c goal of 6.5 or less than 6.5 uh, this is to avoid iatrogenic hypoglycemia in pregnancy OGTT is the diagnostic test which is to be done at 24 to 28 weeks a fasting of more than 92 of an hour of more than 180 and the two hours of more than 153 is diagnostic monitoring is done by self monitoring of blood glucose and HbA1c as I said is not useful apart from probably in the first trimester the glycemic targets should be pre meal 95 one hour post meal 140 and two hour post meal 120 in pregnancy the targets are a little more, bit more stringent self-monitoring of blood glucose is a mainstay of uh, monitoring diabetes in patients who are well motivated for it who can adjust their treatment based on that 
because without adjusting treatment there is no point in monitoring blood glucose they can monitor if it is important in type 1 diabetes motivated type 2 diabetes with the very uh, levi kind of a diabetes in pregnancy it should be done and in patients who have recurrent hypoglycemia or hypoglycemic dips in the night probably smbg would be a good idea in acute illness you can have uh, patients monitor their smbg continuous glucose monitoring systems can be used to stabilize patients on insulin pumps to maintain patients who have very unstable sugars and in pregnant diabetics some practical considerations depending on our opds and our setup cgss pune we should have some system that is what i feel we should have some system of recording uh, monitoring of patients of diabetes because sometimes what happens investigations have been done or probably uh, the patient is not bringing them because we have not recorded them we don't know that they have been done we are again doing it and we are wasting money or probably we are duplicating work so recording of whatever in investigations have been done is very important to avoid duplication of the investigations and then again assessing whether how, whether and what time period should be monitored we don't have any specific diabetic patient records but uh, if we can develop one i think it will be useful this is just something which i thought uh, can be a sort of a prototype for that kind of a record we can have basic uh, basic uh, records which includes complications which include associated conditions we can see at a glance what the patient has and uh, what is the current problem then the examination history the uh, family history the pedigree chart and uh, it's not very clear I, i don't think you can see it from there but uh, for retinopathy and for neuropathy you can have a pictorial for this kind of a depiction and the hbavc and all other investigations can be recorded date wise treatment 1 2 then another aspect is financial considerations this is the pune rate list and these are the investigations which should be done annually so if you to- if even if you don't send it to our lab if you don't send it to mukunnagar and all the investigations are done in a private lab according to cghs rate it boils down to somewhere around 600 rupees for all annual investigations which have to be done on a yearly basis for one patient so i think 600 rupees for one patient on a yearly basis for monitoring all investigations and picking up complications early is is as a good investment uh, any other practical aspects any suggestions are most welcome uh, that's it as goes thank you